Hello, my friends, and welcome to the island of Patmos. My name is John, and I have been tasked with welcoming new prisoners to the island. The work is hard, but the guards are mostly fair. And by the way, it doesn't matter what crime sent you here. As long as you follow the rules, all will be well. What's that? You want to know what sent me here? Well, that's simple, really. I was a disciple of Jesus and a leader of the followers of the way. I'm here exiled on Patmos because I love Jesus more than life itself. I'm here because I wouldn't stop telling people the story of Jesus. So they sent me here. Hey, the guards won't be here for a while. Do you mind if I tell you the story of Jesus while we wait? Come on. <laughs> Where to begin? Uh, where to begin? We begin at the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He created all that there is, and apart from Him, nothing was created that has been created. And in Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Who is Jesus? He's the eternal Word of God. He's the light of the world. He's God. And yet Jesus left the splendor of heaven to come and tabernacle among us, to live as a human in flesh. He was born in Bethlehem as a helpless baby. Fully God, fully man, the only one that could be a bridge between the both. And Jesus grew up in almost obscurity as a child, the son of a common carpenter. Oh, that reminds me, I must tell you about John the Baptizer. John was a preacher. He preached near the Jordan River, and he would say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. One of my friends, Andrew, and I became disciples of John the Baptizer. Now, many people thought that John was the Messiah, or he could be even a prophet brought back from the dead. But as great as John was, he wasn't the Messiah, he wasn't the light. God had chosen John to point out the Messiah. And as John baptized people near the Jordan River, one day a man came. and John was more excited than we had ever seen him. It was the first time that I saw Jesus. He asked that John would baptize him. And John said he was unworthy. He said, you should baptize me instead. But the Lord insisted and John obeyed. When John baptized Jesus and lifted him from the water, we saw something like a dove descend upon him. It was the Holy Spirit anointing him for his ministry. Then we heard a voice from heaven, the voice of God the Father. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Not long after this, Andrew, his brother Peter, my brother James, and I and others we're called to follow Jesus as his disciples. Oh, the things that we saw as we walked with Jesus. Even then we could tell there was something special about him. Something that made us want to follow him. 
And so we left our families and our homes and our businesses to follow Jesus. I'll never forget the first miracle that I saw Jesus perform. We were at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and everything was going fine, but the wedding party had run out of wine, and Jesus' mother asked Jesus to help so the wedding party wouldn't be shamed. Jesus told the house servants to take large stone pots and take them to the well and fill them with water, and and they did. They filled it to the brim. And they told the servants to serve a cup of the water to the master of ceremonies, and they did. And, and when they did their faith, Jesus responded by transforming that water to the most sweet wine we had ever tasted. The master of ceremonies said it was the best wine he had ever had. Oh, the things that we saw. Jesus opened blind eyes and deaf ears. He made the lame to stand up and leap. He cast out demons and healed all manner of sicknesses. He even brought people back from the dead, like Lazarus, one of our close friends. He was dead for four days, and Jesus called him by name, and he walked out of the tomb, resurrected by the power of God. But not only was Jesus' miracles amazing, he taught with godly authority and wisdom. The religious leaders were often stumped by him as they tried to challenge and question him. I remember the first Passover we celebrated with the Lord. We had gone to the temple. And in those days, there were people selling sacrifices at the temple gate. Jesus became enraged that they were exploiting the people of God and making it hard to offer their sacrifices. And he he turned the tables over in the temple. And he made a whip and he chased them off and they ran and fled. He said, don't make my father's house a den of thieves. Now the Pharisees, they asked for a sign. What authority do you have to do this in the temple, they said. And Jesus responded, the only sign that I'll give you is if you destroy this temple in three days, I will rebuild it. We didn't know then that he was talking about his own body, that he would die and he would, I'm getting ahead of myself. But Jesus' actions in the temple that day must have caused quite a stir because not long after that, a man named Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, he came to see the master at night. He was respectful. He had questions that he wanted the master to answer. Now, Nicodemus, you have to understand, was was a Pharisee. He was well-respected in our community as a righteous and honorable man. His whole life was devoted to the worship of Yahweh and serving in the temple. He spent his time studying the scriptures, praying, fasting, giving to the poor. And do you know what Jesus said to him when he met him? He said, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Nicodemus was pretty confused by this, and if I'm honest, we were too. If Nicodemus wasn't good enough to go to heaven, then who could be? And what on earth could it mean to be born again? Jesus said, what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit, and to go to heaven, you have to be born in the Spirit, not just born in the flesh. And we began to wonder, how could anyone be good enough to go to heaven? Then Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Ah, you have to trust in Jesus, not in your own good works. That's how you get to heaven. Grace. Grace. God's unearned favor. That's what we need, grace. And Jesus showed so much grace to sinful and broken people in his ministry. There was the woman in Samaria. We, we were not supposed to even be there. Samaritans and the Jews have no dealings. But the Lord directed us to go, and we went, and he sent us into the city to get some food, and he waited at the well when a woman came, a scandal, an outcast among outcasts. She had been married five times. 
now was living with a man who wouldn't marry her. And she came to draw water in the hottest part of the day so no one would see her. And there Jesus was. He told her what she really needed was to drink of living water. And that life would come from within her for those who put their faith in him. She rejoiced at the grace of Jesus. She was one of the first people to place their faith in Jesus as Savior. In fact, she brought the entire town to come and meet Jesus. There was another woman caught in the very act of adultery. The religious leaders brought her to Jesus to test him. Would he deny his teaching of showing grace, or would he deny the law and the prophets which demanded sinners to be killed and condemned? (laughs) But they made a terrible mistake because they brought a sinner who needed a Savior to the Savior whose heart is full of grace. He knelt down and wrote something in the sand. I'm still not sure what. When he stood, he, he told the men there with the stones, ready to stone the woman, if you've never sinned, throw the first stone. And one by one by one, starting with the oldest, They dropped their stones and they left. Jesus knelt down to the woman, her weeping. He said, who is there that would condemn you? She said, there is no one. And Jesus looked at her with eyes full of grace. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Grace. Grace. God's grace. Oh, have I told you about the man born blind and how Jesus healed him? This is a good one. When we saw him, we asked the Lord, whose sin caused his blindness? Was it his parents or was it his own sin? And Jesus said that it wasn't for anyone's sin, but it was so that the glory of God could be shown through him. And and Jesus spit on the ground in front of him and made some mud out of the dirt. And we couldn't believe it when Jesus took the mud and wiped it in the poor man's eyes and told him, go wash off in the pool of Siloam, which was a good ways away. And when he washed his face, he saw for the first time, grace, grace, God's grace. When the religious leaders heard about it, they were angry. They called the man to testify before them, and they wanted to know all about Jesus. Where did he come from? Who was he? How could he have the power to open blinded eyes? And the the man said, I don't know the answers to your questions. All I know was I was blind, and then I met Jesus, and now I can see. His own parents wouldn't stand to defend him, and he was cast out of the synagogue. It was the first time that I realized that walking with Jesus could be so costly. Jesus soon began to tell us that he was the good shepherd, but that there were thieves and wolves that would want to hurt the flock of God. But people continued to believe in Jesus by the droves. The religious leaders just got more and more jealous, more and more determined to get rid of them. They began to plot Jesus' death. On the final time that we celebrated the Passover feast, as we came into Jerusalem, Jesus riding on a colt, the people spread branches in their garments in the road, and they they yelled, Hosanna in the highest, glory to God. They were announcing that Jesus was the King, the Messiah. They understood. Oh, the religious leaders were furious. Jesus began to warn us that he would die, and soon... We couldn't believe it. We wouldn't believe it. We didn't realize that this would be the last Passover feast we would celebrate with the Lord. When we got to the feast, he did something remarkable. Even more amazing than the miracles, even more amazing than the teaching. He he stood up and he girded himself with a towel like a common servant, and he began to wash our feet at the table. One by one by one, he came and served us. Most of us just stood there dumbfounded that the Lord would stoop so low to wash our feet. Peter, well, Peter 
told the Lord he couldn't wash his feet. And the Lord looked at him with eyes full of grace. And he said, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part in my kingdom, no part in me. And Peter said, then just wash me all over, Lord. (laughs) Peter was kind of like that. (laughs) And then the Lord was distraught with grief. We could all see it on his face. He said that one of us would betray him that very night. We, We couldn't imagine that any of us would do such a thing. I was sitting next to the Lord, very close to him, and so Peter motioned to me to ask him what he was talking about or who it could be, and, and Jesus said that he would, he would let us know who the traitor was by giving them a piece of bread, and Judas was sitting on the other side of Jesus, and he handed the bread to him. And then Judas, the Lord told him, what you go do, go do quickly. And Judas excused himself, and He kept our money, and we just assumed that he was going to buy some supplies for the feast. We were so filled with sorrow, so confused, we didn't quite understand what Jesus was trying to tell us. Well, he must have been able to see how saddened we were, because he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. And he told us that he was going to go and prepare a place for us and he would come back for us so that we could be with him forever and ever. And Jesus then led us to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a favorite place of the masters to go and pray and to get away from the crowds. And on the way there, he told us that to be fruitful for his kingdom, we had to abide in him. And he told us that he would send the Holy Spirit to come and abide in us so that we could be everything that God wanted us to be and do everything that God wanted us to do. And as we entered into the garden, we walked over the Kidron Valley where the blood of the lambs from the temple flowed. Jesus asked the disciples to pray. He took Peter, James, and I a little bit further into the garden and asked us to pray. And he went about a stone's throw away. And he fell on his face in prayer before the Lord. We were so exhausted. We fell asleep. In the time where our master needed us the most, we slept. The next thing I remember was Jesus awakening us. And as we woke, we looked, and in the distance, we saw hundreds of temple soldiers with torches. And G- Judas was leading them, leading them to the master. Oh, Judas. What were you thinking? When the soldiers came close, Jesus said, Who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. And at the sound of his voice, the soldiers fell over at the power of God. And yet they came to arrest him still. He said, since you're after me, then let these other men go. Even then, he was concerned for our safety. The other disciples fled, and the soldiers let them. They were only there for Jesus. I followed along, and Peter did too at a distance. As the guards led Jesus to the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the religious leaders. This is where the guards began to mock and spit upon Jesus and begin to beat him in the face. This hearing had nothing to do with justice or righteousness. They had already made up their minds to condemn Jesus, and they had bribed witnesses to lie about him. But the religious leaders hated Jesus so much, they wouldn't be satisfied unless he died the most vile of executions. Crucifixion. Now, only the Romans had the authority to crucify. So after their sham of a trial, they took Jesus to the governor, Pontius Pilate. Now, Pilate could find no fault in Jesus. There was no fault to find. But Pilate was afraid of the people and wanted to please them if he could. After questioning Jesus He decided there was no fault, and he wanted to release him. And it was his custom every year about the Passover to release a prisoner of the crowd's choosing. Pontius Pilate thought they certainly would release Jesus. 
They chose a robber named Barabbas instead. Again, Pilate questioned the Lord, and again, he found no fault in them. He had Jesus flogged, tied to a post, whipped across the back, his beard pulled from his face. They made a crude crown made out of reedy thorns, and they pushed it into his brow. They gave him a scepter and beat him with it. They put a purple cloak on him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And when Pilate presented Jesus to the crowd, he said, Behold the man. So disfigured was he, I barely recognized him. There Jesus stood, bloodied, humiliated, beaten. Pilate said, What would you have me do with your king, the king of the Jews? The crowd yelled out, We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The same crowd that just days before had yelled Hosanna in the highest. Jesus comes as the king of Israel. Some of them were in the crowd now yelling, demanding Jesus' execution. And so after the beatings and the ridicule, they made my Jesus to carry his cross to Golgotha, the place of the skull. It was like a nightmare. I walked with Jesus' mother Mary and the rest of his family. We followed him, helpless to do anything. As Jesus carried his cross all the way to the place of the skull. And when he got there, they threw Jesus down on his cross and they, they drove a nail into either of his hands, into the beams, and one through both of his feet. And they erected the cross and slumped it into place. And there Jesus hung. Grace. Grace. God's grace. I stood there with Jesus' family, Jesus' mother, for what seemed like an eternity. The sky grew dark as if nature itself was mourning the death of her king. For hours, and still they mocked him. He helped others. Can't he help himself? Where is God if you're his son? Shouldn't he come and help? Oh, there were legions of angels that would have rescued him with a single word. And there he hung. Grace. Grace. God's grace. After we had been there some hours, Jesus looked down at me and told me to take care of his mother. And with the last of his strength, he cried out, To tell us, die. It is finished. Paid in full. He bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. No one could take his life, but he gave it freely. Now the Romans wanted to make sure that he was dead, and so they took a spear and they plunged it into his side, and when they removed it, blood and water poured out. There's no doubt he was dead. One of the disciples of Jesus, a man named Joseph, was a wealthy man. and He offered to allow Jesus to be buried in his family's tomb. He, along with Nicodemus, who came in the middle of the night to meet the master, anointed the body of Jesus and gave him the best burial that they could under the circumstances. I led Mary and Jesus' family back to the upper room. And one by one, the other disciples made their way back there. And we sat in agonizing silence, barely able to breathe. No one moved. We just sat there in shock and disbelief. 
We sat there for a couple of days in that way. Everyone afraid to even make the smallest of motions. All hope was lost. You see, Jesus was the Messiah. We knew it. We had given up everything to follow him. We had seen the miracles. We had heard his teaching. And now he's dead. Despair. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene awoke early to go anoint the body of Jesus properly since there wasn't time before. When she got to the tomb, the stone that guarded the doorway had been rolled out of the way and Jesus' body was not to be found. She ran back to us and she told us. And As soon as Peter and I heard it, we ran out the door and I made it there first. And I looked into the garden tomb from the doorway and the body wasn't there. Jesus' burial cloths were folded neatly where his body lay. Peter came and walked right by me, and he went into the tomb too. There was no doubt that, that Jesus' body was gone. Now, now, the religious leaders paid the soldiers to tell the people that we had taken the body, but we were helpless. We wondered who would do such a thing. Who would come and desecrate the tomb of the Lord and steal his body? We ended up back in the upper room and That evening, Jesus appeared in our midst, and he said, Peace be with you, dressed in white, alive, radiating the glory of God. The wounds from his crucifixion still there, the scars still there, but his body perfect otherwise. He was alive, resurrected by the power of God. For 40 days, He taught us and encouraged us. For 40 days, hundreds of people saw him resurrected alive. He told us that there was a mission, that all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him, and the mission was that we would make disciples of all of the nations, that we would baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and we would teach everything that the Lord had taught and commanded. And then he said that he would send the Holy Spirit, our helper, to empower us so that we could do just that. And then we watched as he ascended into heaven with two angels at his side. Further and further and further and further until he was out of sight. Now the Lord had told us to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. And so for 10 days, we waited in the upper room, waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, we were there praying in the upper room, and there was a mighty rushing wind that came into the room, and what seemed like tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit fell on those of us who believed in Christ. It was the birth of the church. The Holy Spirit came and filled us and empowered us Now we apostles were able to do miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter preached a sermon and and 3,000 souls placed their faith in Jesus that day because the Holy Spirit was so powerful. Oh, the things I could tell you that happened. You, You really should read Sir Luke's account to Theophilus, the Acts of the Apostles. Miracles and miracles and victories and victories. But before Jesus died, he warned us that if the world hates him, that the world would hate those who follow him. Stephen, one of our first deacons, a godly man if you've ever met one, his face shone like an angel was stoned to death by the religious leaders. He was the first. Not long after that, James, my brother, killed by the sword. One by one, by one, by one, I have heard that the other apostles have been killed. 
and not just the apostles, but many of our brothers and sisters killed by swords, by stonings, fed to wild animals, burned alive, crucified. Peter, just years ago, crucified upside down because he didn't think himself worthy to die the same way Jesus did. Even Brother Paul, who once persecuted us after years of imprisonment, was killed by Rome. I'm the only one that's left now. I'm the only one that's left now. And here I am with you on Patmos, an exile for the rest of my days. But don't misunderstand me. I'm not discouraged. Can I tell you a secret? On this very island, not long ago, I was, on, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, worshiping the Lord. And I heard a voice behind me like a trumpet, clear, strong, beautiful, And when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of those seven golden lampstands, I saw, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in white to the feet, with a golden belt, eyes like burning flames, feet like burnished bronze, a double-edged sword in his mouth, and in his right hand he held seven stars. And when I saw him, I fell as a man dead. He knelt down, and he put his right hand upon my shoulder. And he commanded me to take courage and to stand. And I recognized his voice. It was my Jesus my closest friend, my rock, my redeemer, the word of God, the light of the world, the lamb of God slain and resurrected and glorified. He stood me up. And oh, the things he revealed to me. He showed me things that have happened and things that are happening now. And he even showed me things that are going to happen in the future. He showed me angels and Heaven. He showed me the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. He he showed me a time in the future where he wipes away every tear and death is no more. I saw the assembly of God's people praising Jesus in heaven. And among them, those who had died for him, resurrected in his power. And he said, I'm coming soon. Oh, my new friends, do you know him today? Death, Hades, sin. Jesus showed me he has victory over every enemy, every heartache, and every sin. Do you know him today? Jesus also showed me that there is trouble coming to the earth like the earth has never experienced. The wrath of God poured out on creation like has never happened in all of history. Oh, my friend, you don't want to bear the wrath of God. I have seen it. But Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life the only way to the heart of the Father. Even so, I say, Maranatha, Lord, come today. Let
Spirit.